Hello and welcome to My Quirky Rides and this video will be look at servicing the Messerschmitt and what's involved. So this particular car was uh, made in 1959 and it, so it's over 60 years old and uh, during its lifetime nearly everything has been overhauled or replaced so it's not an original car by, by any means. And in the 14 or so years that I've owned it uh, most things have been replaced or overhauled and uh, it it has been such huge fun though and uh, it's become more like a, a family member than just a car but more like a, a family pet really so it does attract a lot of attention sometimes too much attention in a way but uh, that's what it is and uh, I think if I did have to sell it tomorrow I wouldn't regret having owned it so uh, this is to give you more of a flavour of what these quirky cars are like, rather than a, a technically detailed account of servicing, because uh, people are far more knowledgeable than me about these cars. But just wanted to give you an idea of, of what things are like. So we'll start with the tyre pressures, which are 18 PSI on the front and round about 28 on the rear. So let me just quickly show you some of these books, which are very useful. So the first one is The Book of the Bubble Cars by Cyril Ayrton. Very useful little book, this one. And it gives you lots of technical information about uh, Messerschmitt and also uh, the uh, little uh, owner's handbook, the Messerschmitt KR200, which is again very useful for basic um, hints and tips and uh, things like that. So that's a useful reference. And also the almost indispensable KR200 manual. Very useful. Right, so there were uh, four greasing points on the front of the Messerschmitt, which I will show you in, in just a second. So I've uh, removed the front wheel just to give you uh, an idea of what the suspension looks like. And look how small this uh, front drum is. It's absolutely tiny. And uh, under here, I'll just show you the greasing points. If you can see them, it's probably not very clear. They often get seized up and they can be quite temperamental and it can lead to the brakes pulling to one side. Okay, so I've tried to shine a bit more light on here. So, again, this is the uh, this is the, the grease nipple for the, the brake, and uh, this one here is for the kingpin. So you can see the brake moves like that when you press the brake pedal down. It's uh, cable activated. Right, so if you excuse the, uh, the, we've got some guy doing the gardening, so he's got the strimmer going. Hope you can hear okay. So this is the handbrake inside the car, which moves the activate, actuating rod down here. Now that is linked to the, um, to the brake pedal. So it's to say it's cabled, there's a cable there, and it's linked to all three wheels. So the handbrake and all three wheels, they're all, all linked together. And there isn't really any separate adjustment on the handbrake as such. So you have to make sure the, um, the brake pedal, the foot brake is well adjusted. And just about here, sometimes it's easy to remove this, this uh, lever. You've got this, I'll show you on this side. Actually, this, this is the fine adjustment for the, um, the foot brake one either side. If I remember, I think that's a, a 10 or 11 mil. So that's a locking nut there, and then you just screw this in or out accordingly. Right, so moving back to the, so you can rotate this whole lever and give you a, a course adjustment. So we've got a shock absorber there bump stop there and rubber torsion bar suspension here. So if I spin the wheel you can see that if I pull on that lever it stops like that. 
while I've removed the, the cover, I just want to show you that there's some bit of play in the steering there. See this, I really need to change this. There's a bearing in there that, that uh, I need to replace. That's quite bad actually. So anyway, you've got the, uh, the steering bar here and then that moves the, uh, it moves the, uh, the uh, control arms either way. You can adjust the, the, the length here and here, but I haven't been able to find any information about the, uh, what the tracking, the, the front towing should, should be. So if anyone has any information on what that should be, just let me know. So as I said, the, the drum brakes are tiny and they are prone to, um, they are prone to brake fade. And um, so they need regular adjustment. As I said before, the brakes can um, seize and pull to one side. Undo the catches. Okay, so here is the uh, the clutch lever, which is uh, actuated by the pedal with a uh, with a cable. Here's the return spring here, and uh, with the clutch, um, the best way to check the adjustment is by removing the cable, which is which uh, comes through here. And uh, when you've removed the cable, uh, see if the lever can be moved, uh, this lever itself moved 10 to 15 millimeters if it's got that amount of free play in it. If not, the adjuster screw can be, uh, the clutch cable can be adjusted. The interior adjuster screw can also be adjusted and uh, I'll show that in a moment. This is uh, just a screw, it's very difficult to see, it's just about there. I don't know if you can see it through there. It's easy to actually remove this cowling, but there's a, I think it's a 10 mil, just there where the, the finger's pointing, just in there. No, not very clear. It's just, just in there, the just a screw. Remove the, um, the clutch cover plate here, and here is the the four plate wet clutch, and here is the um, the adjustment another adjustment for the for the clutch here. So it's a case of undoing this uh, lock nut here, and then turning this in or out to get the adjustment of the clutch there. And all the, also this is where uh, we top up the uh, the gear oil. I've got here. This is called. Gear Lube M90, this is a non-hypoid oil. Now the reason being, if you put a hypoid oil in, you get the clutch slipping. And so it just starts, to, I have got the front of the car still jacked up, so it work, it's, to get the right amount of oil, you have to lift one end of the car up. So it's about 750 million milliliters, about three quarters of a liter, to fill it up when empty. Right, so this is the, uh, the, the uh, chain case. It's an oil bath, enclo fully enclosed chain. A rear sprocket is behind this dome cover here. And you've got a fill level here, and you've got a level check here, so uh, when you know the when you know it's just about right, it just starts to dribble over there. So uh, I'll just just check that in a minute.
Oil just starting to come out there, so that looks okay. Right, I've just removed the uh, the uh, points cover to expose the contact breaker points here. And we've got two sets of points here. We've got a forward set here and a reversing set here because uh, the engine is designed to run backwards as well and it uses these points here. So if I just rotate the wheel, you probably have to see the points opening and closing. So I'm just putting my trusty feeler gauge in there. So it should be between 0.4 and 0.5 millimetres. Now the ignition timing itself should be between 0.45, sorry, the ignition timing should be 4.5 to 5.5 millimetres before the piston reaches top dead centre. The point should just begin to open. And I've got this um, handy depth gauge here, which, um, which you can screw into the spark plug hole and uh, tells you um, at what point the piston is reaching the desired height or depth or whatever, 0.5 millimetres, then uh, you know that the timing is, is right. And in here, it's that one there, undo that one there, and then you rotate the base plate. And then you tighten the screw up and then that gives you the timing of front and retard. Another thing to remember is there's uh, from the club they do bosch this um, cam and these wear out and uh, after a while you can get um, quite poor running there's a little tight in there there's a little tiny nylon heel that rubs against this and and uh, as this rotates it causes the points to open and close so uh, so it's important to keep this well lubricated with the right grease and electronic ignition systems are available if this is really worn. Sometimes the uh, carburetor float chamber can get uh, a crud at the bottom and sediment from the fuel tank and this can cause the float needle to stick. So let's have a look at the float. So the, uh, the float seems quite happy in there. It does uh, seem to be going up and down. Uh, there's a needle valve at the bottom of this as well and that can cause the float to stick um, often in the uh, down position and so the petrol doesn't uh, shut off at the right time and then it floods into the engine causing no end of problems and sometimes these floats can get punctured as well it's uh, also important to remember to uh, get the focus it's also important to remember to turn the fuel off as well because that way you know, sometimes the uh, float valve doesn't work particularly well and, and that can also cause the fuel to flood into the, to the engine. Also, sometimes uh, this pipe here, the uh, fuel pipe, can um, perish or split and it did split uh, for me one time and uh, fuel was gushing out everywhere but fortunately it split quite near the end here. So. I, I happened to have some tools with me when I was out and about. I've cut the end off and I've just pulled it on further onto the end of this fitting and it stopped leaking. So on the carburetor we have the, uh, where is it there? the idle screw here which controls the tick over of the, of the engine. So you undo this lock nut here and then you um, screw in to increase the revs or screw out to decrease the revs here. But when you're setting up, um, this control basically there's a sliding barrel valve and it just, this screw sort of pushes it, the, the, uh, the slider up slightly. And this one here, if I can just, that one is the, the mixture screw. Uh, there's a certain knack to getting the right adjustment here. And the handbook talks about warming up the engine and then reducing the revs with the idling screw here, then using the mixture screw here to bring the revs up again. Another problem is if the, if the revs are really high, it could be the carburetor gasket behind here, causing the engine to suck in more air. 
and for the engine to over rev. So uh, I'm going to leave all this well alone as the car is running well at the moment. So this is the uh, this is the air cleaner. Uh, it's not normally supposed to be dented like this. Um, that's just how I acquired it. Uh, I think the previous owner tried to shape it to go around the exhaust. But anyway, this uh, the air. This is the air intake here. Comes in here and then to the carburetor. There, there is a um, a, a cleaning uh, a, a filter inside here that you can clean with with petrol or paraffin. And then the idea is you blow the dust through with an airline. And inside here is the uh, is the Dynastart, which is a uh, combined um, generator starter. And the th there's brushes inside here, motor brushes, which should be replaced about every seven and a half thousand miles. So uh, when you're um, overhauling the Dynastart to remove the armature, you need a special puller, which is um, one of these. So you screw this in the end of the armature and then you wind this nut in on the end and it pulls the whole thing out. But uh, that's beyond the scope of, of this video. So. so another thing to point out is that I should have a spare wheel here, but I don't have a spare wheel. But uh, I just wanted to show you the, uh, the fuel tap. This is the um, underneath and you can unscrew this. This is, there's a filter under here and uh, you know, you, you can clean this out to get rid of sediment and here's the fuel line going down to the carburetor. So behind here this is what's called a carden shaft here and it's a it's got a, a kind of a bit like it's like a, a sort of a small half shaft really so you've got um, the gearbox output here with a sprocket on the end and this this shaft comes along here and then provides drive to the um, to the chain to the chain and you've got here you've got rubber in, uh, in torsion suspension the same as the front and these they are a bit tricky to fit and yes you can fit them the long way round I think when I did mine I'll, I just got lucky so uh, I've just uh, removed the spark plug and I've given it a good, good clean so I'll we'll just uh, check the gap the um, it's uh, should be 0 0.7 mil Just pop the spark plug back in. Put the rubber seal back on to stop it from overheating and get getting a good seal with the, uh, the fan blowing the air around. Put the uh, plug cap back on. I did have a problem with the uh, a plug cap before where uh, it was sparking arcing against the uh, against this, the rubber, it was really strange. So as soon as I took the rubber out, it worked. So I had to replace the plug cap. And here we've got the Teleflex cable, which is a semi-flexible cable with the, which operates the, this uh, gear change rod here on, on the gearbox. And that goes inside the car. So it's operated thusly with this and it is adjustable. There's a clamp behind this panel here, which you can slacken off and move the cable backwards or forwards, but you can also move it across here. You've got these, uh, where are we? This, uh, this clamp here, so you can loosen these two nuts off here and then pull the cable down to get adjustment that way as well. And you've also got the, uh, the neutral selector lever here, which is on the end of the, uh, the gear lever. And uh, 
The neutral selector allows you to take the car out of gear, regardless of which gear you happen to be in. So the gears themselves are sequential, they go backwards and foot forwards. So it's like a motorbike with first gear back, to, back towards you and then you've got two, three, four going that way towards the, the dashboard. So uh, to adjust the neutral selector, you undo this, undo the screw here and uh, you pull, there's a cable just under there, you, you pull it through. This does need adjusting actually. So the idea is you can select neutral from whatever gear you happen to be in at the time. One thing I'd like to point out that, uh, as you see here, this is a, a fairly typical spark plug here, which takes a 14 mil, 14 mil um, spark plug spanner. Pop that in there like that. But this one from the Messerschmitt uh, is much bigger. So uh, just be mindful of when you're um, going to change a spark plug that, uh, or when you're, you know, it's very good to have the right tool in the car because if you just have a standard plug spanner, you're not going to be able to, to replace it. So I'll just do a quick measure up of the... Uh, So you're going to need, where are we, 25, 26 mil, am I reading that right? And here's your normal spark plug. Okay, yeah. So just under a 21, just under. So there's the difference. So thanks very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the uh Messi Smith and I'll see you in another video. Okay, bye.